Also, uh, happy Mother's Day. I'm not going to do a Mother's Day message, but I do have a cool story. And this is a common story, so you may be familiar with this story. But uh, it's one of my favorite stories about Mother's Day. Um, one day, Thomas Edison, you all know him, the great inventor, probably one of the best inventors in, in uh, uh, American history. One day, Thomas Edison came home and gave a paper to his mother. He was a little kid. He told her, my teacher gave this paper to me and told me to only give it to my mother. It was sealed. His mother's eyes were tearful as she read the letter out loud to her child. Your son is a genius. The school is too small for him and doesn't have enough good teachers for training him. Please teach him yourself. After many, many years, after Edison's mother died, and he was now one of the greatest inventors of the century, one day he was looking through old family things, suddenly saw a folded paper in the corner of a drawer in a desk. He took it and opened it up. On the paper was written, <clears throat> excuse me, your son is mentally ill. We won't let him come to school anymore. Edison cried for hours, and then he wrote in his diary, Thomas Alva Edison was a mentally ill child that by a hero mother became the genius of the century. Man, that breaks me up, buddy. Good stuff. Um, I thought about doing a Mother's Day message. Sometimes I do on special days. Some days I'm not. But I just felt the Lord just tell me, just talk about the basics of Christianity. And so that's what we're going to do today is talk about the importance of the Bible. And I want to frame it this way. Right now, we are in a cultural war in our country. And I'm going to tie this to the Bible in just a minute. It is a huge cultural war. The war is between the standards of God and us. Up to about 1950, the default standards of how our society was organized and how we organized ourselves was the Word of God, which can be revelation, but it's primarily in this sense of the culture through the Bible. You know, the Ten Commandments was everywhere. And that was, whether we followed or not, most people knew it. Some New Testament Christians say that the Ten Commandments is not for today. Well, fine. Go with the Two Commandments. They're harder than the Ten Commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Either one, pick one. But that was the default. And then for the last 60 years, we've made a major flip, just like Adam and Eve did in the garden, and say, we will not listen to your word. We will do what we desire. That's what I mean. God's standards versus us. And this is everywhere. I will do what I, makes me happy, and I will define truth as I define truth. God will let you do that just like He did Adam and Eve in the garden. He does not stop you. If you want to know what political persuasion God is, He's a libertarian. He doesn't force you to do anything. And that may be not libertarian politically, but you get my point. He's into liberty. He'll give you the freedom if you choose to do it, but you assume responsibility for yourself. And so for the last 60 years, since 1964, where they kicked the Bible and the Ten Commandments out of of schools, it's been uh, more and more us, what we decide, versus the Bible. Even last week when I was preaching on a totally different subject last week, the Lord gave me a, a, a thought of where Christians are in this region. <clears throat> and have you ever had that happen? You're talking to somebody or speaking, and he gives you a thought and starts talking to you on a totally different subject? <clears throat> on a totally different subject than what you're talking about? Have you ever had that experience? Surely I'm not the only one. Why does he do that? Why does he wait till you're quiet? <laughs> yeah, that is so true. <coughs> wow, God help me. And so, um, 
Anyway, this thought came across my mind. He says, you know most Christians are lukewarm in this region. They have a little bit of heat, and they like it. That part's what caught me. When we're lukewarm, we've decided sometimes I'll obey God, and sometimes I won't. (coughs) Sometimes, I don't know why I started coughing. You know where that black bin is? I think there's some cough drops in there. I didn't have a cough before now. (coughs) So when we're lukewarm as a Christian, we go, sometimes we follow God and sometimes we don't. You know what that means to God? That means all of your life is not following me. He asks us to be Lord, not to pick and choose like a buffet. And so that's just, I know it's none of us in here, you wouldn't be in here. Hopefully we're trying to obey God the best we know how. But that lukewarm, <coughs> that Luke, man, this might be all of the message. We're going to end on lukewarm, let's repent and go home. <coughs> and so, well, let's see if I can get my voice back under control. And so that's just where we're at. But this, there's two ways to live. The Bible's very clear lawless or righteous. Lawless is where you decide what the law is for your own individual life in the country. And we've decided as a country what the law is. <coughs> we have lost all the semblance of Ten Commandments. Righteous is I will live right before Him. Was there any in there? Yeah, got lucky on that one. So, we'll see if I can talk sucking on these things. Appreciate y'all's patience, man. And so, so us in here, our goal is righteous. Now, there's a clear biblical principles here. When you live according to your own law, it always brings about... Um, <clears throat> It always brings about chaos in your life, and chaos ends up leading to death. I have people all the time, why is our country so chaotic? It's no different than an individual person's life is chaotic. Somewhere we have made choices, thanks, somewhere we have made choices to follow our law instead of God's law. It's as simple as that. Well, how do we become not chaotic? You live righteously. Righteousness leads to order. Order leads to life. If you want life, it's like the tree of life. You live according to His righteousness. It's as simple as that. The world is truly binary. Some of you get that. But it really is truly binary. Law, your own law, any law. Versus his righteousness, his law. And so that's where we're at. And so I want to talk a little bit about um, why the Bible is so important. This is the basics of 101. Right now there's several key things happening in our society that will cause people to get madder than anything. One, you talk about Jesus is the way. Not a way, the way the truth, and the life. There was no ifs, ands, and buts about him. That's why they crucified him. If he said, I'm a way, he would have lived a long life. He said, I'm the way. And you say that in this pluralistic, multicultural society that always lead to God, they get madder than anything. Why do they get so mad? It's not the saying. It's because you're setting up, you live your life or you live his life. There is no middle ground. And you're forcing them to say no, maybe not to you in words, but forcing them to say no in their spirit to God. And it just makes them mad. And right now, uh, and the Bible is the same way. The Bible is very clear. I mean, there are denominations splintering all over this country because they want to define Christianity as they want to define it. 
And we won't go into specifics. You know what I'm talking about, mostly moral issues. They can do whatever they want. God's not stopping them. But let me tell you this. They may have church on the building. They are not a church as defined by God. He has very strict definitions of how he defines things. And it's not to be mean. It's just his way. And he says, if you go this way, it leads to life. If you go this way, it leads to death. And so this huge battle going on over this whole thing. Now, what saddens me, we don't really have much opportunity to influence regional stuff here or even national stuff. But this this thing scares me, and this is why the Bible is so important. Today, you have to make a stand every day. Is Jesus the way or a way? If he's the way, it takes you down a certain path. If he's the way, when I can see the benefit, he's not the way. You're choosing him because it's a benefit to you, and that's an idol. You're the idol. Same with the Bible. Right now, to say you believe in the literacy of the Bible, the inerrancy of the Bible, accuracy of the Bible, you you just made fun of. And it's going to get worse. Persecution is increasing in this country. How many dozens of churches, dozens of pro-life centers have been defamed, defaced, even broken into with no persecution, I mean with no prosecution from the federal government? They're just ignoring it. That's the beginnings of of Christianity being prosecuted. But we're going to stand strong here because in the end we, we win. And people go, no, that couldn't happen. I mean, did you hear about what happened in Virginia? They finally, Congress made them stop. They were planting people in traditional Catholic churches, even uh, confessional booths, to catch people who believed in the pro-life agenda. Spies from the FBI into our churches. Well, they can come in. We believe in the pro-life agenda. If we go to jail, maybe. But I'm going to stand on the side of righteousness. But the, the thing is this. Is Jesus the way and is the Bible accurate? All this stuff that's happening in denominations, they ignore the Bible. Well, you can do that. The Lord will let you do it. But let's, let me throw out this one verse, and I'm going to talk about why we need the Bible. Revelation 21, second to the last chapter, it talks about, if you want to turn there, 21.8, and I'm going to try to get off of the turn or burn judgment talking here, but it's not against us. It's to show the seriousness of you will become whatever standard you follow. Anyway, it has a long list of people. I'm going to come back, but I'm going to jump to the end of 21.8. It has a long list of people. They will... These people will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. That's intense. How many of you want to go there on a vacation spot? But look at who's first in the list. Yeah. I don't know what you do with this. You know, we've got a lot in there that we know about. Murderers, sexually immoral magicians, idolaters, liars, but the first one is cowards? I don't know. I'm not going to delve that one theologically too far, but that's intense, wouldn't you say? And so us here, as we're trying to live the best we know how, go after Jesus, uh, there comes a time where you just got to say, yeah, he's the way. You don't make them do it. You don't scream and holler and do banters and hold up signs. You say, yeah, that's what I believe. Yeah, I believe that the Bible provides standards for us individually and as a culture. Every culture has to have a standard. It just does. I mean, you look at history or it goes into chaos. Why do you think we're going into chaos? Because there's 330 million people in this country and huge portions of them have their own standards. So it's producing chaos, as simple as it. I wouldn't want to live in a Muslim country like Saudi Arabia, but they're stable. I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying it's good how they treat women, but it's stable. Why? Because there's one law. It's called the Koran. I I think it's a lot better to live under one law called the Bible. But they're stable. They don't have, I don't know how many people's there, 
say there's 25 million. They don't have 25 million to side and to side. But for you and I, as we say, my standard is Jesus and the Bible, it will start producing order in your life and life in your life. He's fine. You don't have to take Ezra out unless you want to. You're not bothering me. And so let's talk about the Bible a little bit because it is an amazing book and it is so under attack. Think about this. Let me read this. It is a collection of 66 different books divided into two sections, old and new, written by over 40 different authors over a span of 1,500 years in three different languages with one consistent, united theme of sin produces death, sacrifice, ultimate sacrifice is Jesus Christ produces life. Could you get, let's just think about this. Let's just think uh, Josh and I, he's right here in front of me. Me and him go off somewhere. I write something. He writes something 20 years later. He doesn't even know me. And they get combined into a book. What's the odds that they're going to have the same message? Maybe. Probably not. And that's just two people. Think about if it was 1,500 years apart, 40 different authors in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. It's impossible. It's just statistically not possible. It's an entire library of history, poetry, humor, prophecy, romance, letters, biographies, songs, journals, advisement, laws, and stories all up to the same thing. It was the first book ever printed on the printing press. <coughs> Even to this day, it's the best-selling book. Why would anybody buy a book that was dead and just full of law, of, of legalistic stuff? It's because it has changed more lives than any other thing on the planet. Yes, it's not God, but God ordained the language, and His life flows through that book when you read it. People have sacrificed their lives to bring books into North Korea. I mean, the Bible into North Korea and Iran. And when they get it, they treasure it because it's more than just a book like uh, Homer or, uh, or Socrates or any of these other famous people. When they do it, it activates a link between you and the Creator and it brings something in that you could get in nothing, no other way. It is, as of the time I wrote this, which was a little while ago, it's been translated into almost 2,000 different languages. Nothing's that close. It's a book of blessing, benefits, comfort, strength, hope, and wisdom. Let me read to you some quotes. Victor Hugo, Hugo, he wrote a famous book called Les Miserables out of England. What was it, 100 years ago or maybe? England has two books, the Bible and Shakespeare. England made Shakespeare, but the Bible made England. What a good quote. Here's Immanuel Kant. If you're into philosophy, he's one of the world's most influential philosophers. He was not a Christian. Okay? He was one of these guys trying to come up with his own law and called it philosophy. Which most philosophy is that. You know that, don't you, if you studied it. It's their, who's ever you're reading, their system of laws. Yeah, a lot of them had good intentions, but it is what it is. The Bible, so here's Immanuel Kant. The Bible is the greatest benefit which the human race has ever experienced. This is a, not a guy who's a Christian. Listen to this. A sing, and he, he wrote a lot. A single line in the Bible has consoled me more than all the books I ever read besides. That's crazy, isn't it? You know what happens when he stands before God, knowing that? President John Quincy Adams. A little bit different take, but it's a good one. So great is my honor for the Bible that the earlier my children began to read it, the more confident will be my hope that they will prove useful citizens to their country and respectable members of society. Johnny, that's the power of the Bible. I love John 17, 17. This is Jesus' prayer before his arrest. 
Purify them by the truth. Your word is truth. See, that's the battle, isn't it, right now? You can say all day long, I have, I found the truth. I found a truth. People go, yeah, let me tell you about my truth. We all share our stories. We found our truth. We are truly in a postmodern society where the truth, there is no truth except as you define it. That's where we live. We've not been a Christian nation for at least 60 years. I mean, there's Christians in it, but I'm talking about the majority. And so that's where we're at. You hear it in the schools. You hear it in the universities. You hear it in the workplace. You hear it all around us. Reality, truth is your reality. Let me tell you, it's just not true. It's a lie. Well, Craig, you sure are bold. I'm only bold because I'm saying it in 2023, not 1963. This used to be common truth. You have a reality... It's truth in the sense that you're lead, living it. I mean, I'm not going to deny how we feel. But there is a higher truth that if you allow it, He'll start inter- bringing it into your life and helping you line your life up with the truth that's eternal. Your truth dies out whenever you change your mind. You don't get what I'm saying? Your truth which may be what you're experiencing. So I guess some of this is how you define truth. I don't discard what you're experiencing, but you know the Bible gives experiences that you can have if you believe His truth. Most people cannot move themselves beyond themselves to realize there's a truth higher than what I'm experiencing. Am I confusing you? And you know what that word is? We used to call it that. We don't call it this anymore. We call it narcissism. You're consumed with yourself. I know this is harsh, but I want to free people, and I'm old enough that I don't care if you like me anymore. I mean, it's nice when you do. You can never find yourself. People go off to India, go off on a weekend trying to find myself. That's not the answer. You are who you are. There is no deep, latent truth inside of you that you haven't found. I know that's harsh, but I want to free us. I'm speaking against the spirit of this age. I've tried going and finding myself. When I got through, I was usually more depressed than when I started. You are what you are. There is no super thing inside of you that's just latent weather to get out. That would be depressing except for this. When you commit yourself to something greater than you, you find the reason for living because you're living for what's greater than you. And that's your Creator. And somebody says, I've got to go find myself. So good luck. Come back when you get tired of finding yourself. You know how you find yourself? is you commit your life 100% to Jesus Christ, to something bigger than you, and then He gives you your life back the way He wanted you to be created. But you have to die to yourself, pick up Him, and He says, this is the way I really created you. Not all the crazy stuff that happened to you as a kid or an adult or a teenager or the weird thoughts that you brought up. I know. It's... Who was it that said, I must decrease so that he can increase? Was that Apostle Paul? I don't remember who said it. Now I'm the Baptist. That's it. That is the way to happiness. You must decrease, I must decrease, and he must increase. Well, Craig, that's the weirdest, and it is. Compared to American Western thought, nobody says that. Nobody. Nobody, except a few stupid, crazy preachers. I'm telling you, you decrease and say, I'll live for Him, you'll have the best life you've ever known. And you won't be living for yourself. 
But when you live for Him, He brings you in on His journey. Say, this is the way I really create. Oh, I never even saw that. And then something comes up inside of you. It's called the Holy Spirit because you're saved. And the third person, the Holy Spirit, who's given as a seal of the inheritance to come in Ephesians 1, rises up on the inside of you and go, oh, wow, this is why I was created. You'll never find that on your own. I don't care how many monasteries and mountains you go to. You'll probably just end up demon-possessed if you pick up anything. Seriously. And so along with committing your life to the Lord, what you're doing is committing to Him. You don't commit to the Bible per se, but you relish the words that are in there that came from Him. And man has been on the earth for 6,000 years if you believe in a young earth like what I do. If you don't, then you've been here longer. Think how many governments have gone through the earth. Babylonians, Mede, Persians, Egypt. I'm talking empires, not governments. Egyptians, Romans, European monarchies, great nation states like Spain, France, Britain, and now whatever kind of empire the United States has had. We've gone from foraging to farming to feudalism to commerce to industrial revolution to information revolution to whatever revolution we're in now. Yeah. Microsoft Gates says that's the second biggest technological change he's seen in his lifetime. I think he's probably right. And so, let's just pray it gets used for good. So, um, the Bible is still around while all the people were giving the finger to God, saying, I'll do it myself, or long gone dust. You remember a few philosophers like Immanuel Kant or Nietzsche or who popularized God is dead? I wonder what he thinks now. Fashions come and go. So I'm going to try to end this up. I'm going to, because I've gone off on the cultural thing. I am seeing a uh, renaissance in me and in Christians to read the Word of God like never before. Lean into that. Now, depending on how you taught, were taught, that could be one of the most boring thoughts you've ever had. And that's where I want to end up. Some of us have been taught, and it may work for you, it did not work for me. Read the Bible through in a year program or something like that. It just did not work for me. If it works for you, do it. Let me tell you what I do, which is very opposite of the others. I, since I'm a type A personality wanting to get things done, I made sure I got my three chapters done every day so I could read it through in a year. But I did not have any encounters because I was trying to go, am I through yet? Am I through yet? Is anybody else that way? And they have you read through sections that can be incredibly boring, like Numbers or Leviticus. There's some values there, but I'm going to, teach you what I do. Maybe it'll help you. Because I'm telling you, as we start reading the Word of God, we could go on, it sets you free. It changes you. It will tell you more about yourself than any psychology book you can read or any self-help book you can read. You get to know God. Well, how does it do this? So this is what I do. John 16, 13. Write this one down. And you claim it for yourself. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, talking about Holy Spirit, He will guide you on into all truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. Think about this. The Holy Spirit's God. But He doesn't even give His own mind as to what to do. My gosh, and I'm giving my mind to everybody. Here's the Holy Spirit won't even give His own mind. Only what He hears. And He's God. And then He'll tell you what is yet to come. You. I mean, if you're a Christian in here, you have this guy inside of you. Maybe we'll teach about Holy Spirit more in the future, but if you've been here a lot, we've talked about it. He's inside of you. So this is what I do. I, I go to the Lord, and, I, and before I start reading, and I'm just going to be honest with you, most of the time I don't want to read the Bible. I guess there's just parts of me that's just not perfect yet. 
But I do try to be consistent and make it a schedule, so to speak. Why? Because I'm not totally saved. Not even close. And so I need that discipline. But this is what I do when I start. I say, Holy Spirit, what do you want me to read? If I don't know, I usually start with the Gospels or something in the New Testament. Don't start in Revelation. Well, it's just the first three chapters. Those are good. That's where the lukewarm's talking about. <coughs> if you don't get it, hear anything, just start reading the book. And say, Holy Spirit, speak to me while I'm reading this. Why did you write this? Even though you wrote through a man. I don't say all these questions all the time, but why did you write this? Involve him in it. Do not get in a hurry. The last year or so, I will only read one or two verses. And as I walk through it and go, why did you say this? What were you trying to communicate? What does it mean to me? Involve him in it like, like he's sitting there because he is. Is there something you want to show me? How does this passage apply to my life? What aspects of it speak to me? And say, Father, I'm reading not to read. I am reading to encounter you. And if you read three or four b- verses and it's boring as all get out, skip them and go keep reading until you run out of time. And say, Father, I appreciate this. I'm sure to come back up. But look for the, the nudge. Look for the life. Look for the activation in there somewhere. Some days I read, I never get it. Other days I get halfway through a verse and I go, when you feel the Holy Spirit jumping in your spirit or you hear Him speaking to you, don't keep reading because you've got three chapters that day. Stop there and meditate. There have been times I've meditated on a verse for an entire week until I feel that He's done with it. Well, I've got to get through, through my three chapters. Why? You're not reading to read. You're reading to encounter. And if you're encountering them, stay where the encounter is and keep getting truth. For those of you that are on the Live Close devotionals, we're going through the prodigal son now. That's 21 verses. Do you realize I've already written them all out? I don't know what week we're on, maybe fourth week. There's 12 and a half weeks on 21 verses. And I could have kept going. I thought they were going to kill me. A hundred words, 125 words, three times a week for 12 and a half weeks on 12 verses. I'm 21 verses. And I know there's a whole lot more. I've got messages on the prodigal son. I'm not even taught. The Lord hasn't given me release to teach him. On 21 verses. You can get more. Wherever the Holy Spirit's at, you stay there until he's not there anymore. And he'll give you truth after truth after truth. And it's for you then. Wherever that activated. Well, I didn't get activated. They were fine. Go to work. Not your, you know, you did the best you knew how. Just keep reading until you get active. And then stay, maybe even write that verse on an index card, put it on your steering wheel. No, I don't want you to have a wreck. But put it in your pocket, meditate on it at lunch, do different things, and mind that thing. Do you realize there's truths upon truths? It's like the prodigal son. Let's use that as an example. And those of you that aren't on the Live Close devotional, you just have to follow along. Do you realize that's just a simple story about a, do, a son that took his father's money Blew it and came back. That is one level of truth. But man, is it so much richer than that. The story before that, the lady lost one of her gold coins. There's three stories in Luke 15. They're all the same subject. She lost one of her coins. She went crazy till she found her coin. Then she told her whole family, when she found it, I found it. Okay, that's a story. Do you realize it's not about the coin? The Bible says, I speak in parables. People ask him, why do you speak in parables? He said, for those that aren't hungry, they won't understand what I'm saying. That's why when you start reading, go, Father, if I'm not hungry, make me hungry. Draw me. You can't make yourself hungry. Holy Spirit, I want to hear this. The hungrier you are, the more He'll reveal. Proverbs 25, 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. Why would He conceal a matter? The last part of that verse says, 
It is the glory of kings to search out a matter. He wants to see how hungry you are. How bad do you want me? Once you're beyond two or three years old, he doesn't spoon feed you anymore. But when we go after it, he's there with a whole buffet. And so when you read, and get a good translation, don't read King James 1611. If you want to go and read it, fine, but don't make that your main thing. That's the standard King James. If you can read King James, great. I can't really read it. I grew up on it, but I've lost the ability to translate that language since then. So get you one like, you know, New Living Translation or NIV or there's a bunch of them out there. And then just start where you're drawn. The Holy Spirit will draw you to wherever you need to go. And you'll be amazed if you'll bring, if you'll partner with Him and then treasure it in your heart. Write down your notes in your journal or notepad or digital whatever. Write it down. He says, man, I, they're taking this seriously. They think this is good. Wait till, wait till tomorrow. And it's a journey. And um, so let me close with this. There's a concept in the Bible called meditation. It has been totally hijacked by the world. The world's meditation is not biblical meditation. The world's meditation is this. I'm just going to throw it out. I may do injustice to you by going through it too fast. The world's meditation is quiet yourself, do some kind of sound over and over again that puts your mind into a numbness. That's why you see certain Eastern religions going, mm, mm. they're trying to, you know, empty everything. Let me tell you what that will do. It will set you up for demonic possession faster than just about anything except hallucinogenic drugs. Because they open themselves up to anything. That is not biblical meditation. That's passive meditation. Biblical meditation is active meditation. Get a word, I mean a verse or something in the Bible, and meditate on his word. Father, what are you doing here? Think about it, how it applies to your life. When it says meditate, it means meditate on something he said. And it will give further and further meaning to it. And so I just want to challenge you. The Bible is the only thing that's going to restore chaos, is restore order to this country. You don't even have to be a Christian. But if we started following it, like actually persecuting people that kill people, like do not murder. You know, whole sets of stores are closing down in San Francisco and across the country. Walgreens has moved out. Uh, I can't remember the other ones. I've been bad and bad. Why? Because they don't prosecute shoplifters. Why? Because do not steal, one of the Ten Commandments is, well, we don't want to do that one today. Well, that's fine. I'm just glad I don't live in San Francisco. And so, but us, as we follow the Word of God and follow what's happening, it will produce order in your life. And wherever there's chaos in your life, we all have chaos all the time, maybe not all the time, but go, Father, what is not lined up with your Word? Now, you can only line up yourself. I know I'm going long today, but I know you can, you can only line up yourself. If chaos is coming from a spouse, kids, outside of yourself, all you can sort of do is try to put up a wall. You can't force your will on them any more than the Holy Spirit does. But for yourself, you can say, Father, how do I handle this chaos? What boundaries do I put up? Whatever. And you're going to find your whole life, it'll, it'll just change in the end. And so the Bible is not to teach you rules. It's to bring you into an encounter with Him. You'll fi go find yourself going deeper than ever. I've talked long enough. Let's stand. So I would encourage you to lean in to reading and meditating on the Bible like you've never done before. And that's not a time thing. That's a heart thing. It may be ten minutes in the morning, but you got what you needed, and you've got plenty to think about the rest of the day. He's not impressed with you reading three hours a day. Now, if you want to read three hours a day, great. But you don't get any more brownie points with him reading three hours a day than whatever else. Does that make sense? It's an encounter. And when you encounter him, you go, that's why I'm reading. Or when he encounters you, you go, oh, my gosh, he's just shown me the future. Remember earlier he said, I'll show you what is to come? 
He's talked to me many times, and he goes, Craig, you keep doing this. This is what's going to come. Or if you'll act this way, this is what will come. That's what that verse means, not showing who the mark of the beast is or whatever. All right, I appreciate you all listening. Y'all got a lot in here today, man. Some deep stuff, y'all. All right?